starting out more broadly, I want to get a little bit of an intro. You're deploying class eight uh, electric trucks with Enride in your Georgia operations. Uh, talk us a little bit like when are those vehicles going to come online? What are you hoping to learn from them? Uh, give us the inside scoop. Sure, yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I, I think the first thing maybe is just set context about what is Willenius Willemson's involved in what we do, because then it makes a little bit more sense about the partnership with Enride. And, um, you know, we are in the finished vehicle logistics space. We're handling automobiles and heavy truck, heavy equipment. Uh, when we think about Caterpillar, John Deere, and, and Komatsu, for example. And um, for us, you know, our overall ethos has always been a bit of a shaper in the industry in terms of sustainability. And when we look at it from an ecosystem perspective, we're always looking at it from, you know, how do we begin to really develop what's considered these green trade lanes, these green corridors. And so there's the one piece of it for us in the maritime space, which is obviously vitally important. But then once we get to the port of discharge, what are we doing once we get there? Mm -hmm. And... On top of that, you know, we also have developed a, a product called or a service called Equipment Processing, where we're handling big pieces of heavy equipment, as I mentioned, and we're, we're accessorizing them. So we have to move them off the port, and then we have to get them into our equipment processing centers off port. So to your initial question, what we're doing in Georgia, um, we were looking for solutions that could extend that sustainability channel for us once we receive these units into the port of, of Savannah and then move them off to our port, off port location to, to handle and process them. So it was, a, it was a natural place to look at for sustainability for us uh, and putting the Enride product or an EV product of any kind in because it's a very short dray. It's about 10 miles one way back and forth and we're able to do that. Um, but basically 20 times a day with the trucks we'll put into place. So we'll move a million tons of weight, a million pounds of weight rather uh, in, uh, in a day. Uh, going back and forth between those locations. So we have uh, just launched in the last few weeks the first Enride truck uh, back in May. Thank you. Yep, we had a, a, a really nice kickoff in Savannah. We partnered with the Georgia Ports Authority as well in Enride. Uh, and we'll see another uh, a few trucks come on board in, in July uh, of this year. So we're right now prepping those, those uh, trucks. And uh, there you see it behind us. And uh, you can see the type of cargo that I'm talking about and what we move and the ability uh, for them to move it quite easily. So it's been, uh, it's been a really good launch, and I think our scaling efforts now are to see how this operation works. Uh, we are in locations all over the world. Um, we are looking at additional locations here in North America, whether that be in the Mid-Atlantic, in the Pacific Northwest, or in the south, uh, uh, southern parts of California, but we're also looking and working with Enride as an opportunity in, uh, in Northern Europe, in, in Zeebrugge, Belgium. So the scaling effort will We'll continue to evaluate this, uh, this uh, initial effort and then see where we go from there. That's a statement for sure. Just seeing an electric truck pulling cargo like that, wow. Um, so talk to me a little bit about how you go about picking a company to work with like Enright, because the market is very much saturated for mm -hmm. EV service providers, whether that's on the vehicle side, whether that's on the charging side. Um, and then with electric vehicles specifically, they operate differently than a diesel vehicle. So sure. you have to have a right use case for the right vehicle and the right truck operation. So walk us through how do you pick, how do you pick and write and how should everyone else go about? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a really uh, intriguing process for us. It wasn't a pure procurement discussion where we sat down and said, okay, we need new trucks. So let's find a truck and let's see what the alternates look like for EVs. Um, and if that were the case, it would just be about the truck, which is not really the story, right? Um, at the end of the day, this really evolved from our digital accelerator team. Um, it started there as, an, as a, an idea, a concept about what we could do with data and what we could do to improve our operations. From there, of course, then it becomes, you know, concepts to reality and, and, and bringing our, our fleet team and operation team together to say, okay, you know, how can we make this work? How do we bust some of these ideas that we preconceived notions we have about trucks or EV trucks? Um, and it really got down to partnering uh, at the end of the day. Well, who was the right partner? Again, using that term ecosystem, who was the right person and group we wanted to have in that? And Enride was the most forward-leaning. I mean, they were willing to work with us, develop the use case. Of course, the physical conveyance was important, the, the, the EV truck itself, and had to do what we needed it to do. Uh, but it was also the ability to help us in terms of understanding charging infrastructure, 
what that could mean for us, what we were going to, what was going to be necessary in terms of data coming off the, digitiz the, the digitized data coming off the, the, the new uh, trucks themselves. And with the Saga platform, we recognize that not only do we now begin to uh, understand more about how we can build sustainability into our supply chain, but more data, real-time information about how we're actually operating and managing them, not only for the benefit of ourselves and our customers, but for the, for the drivers that we employ as well. So it really wasn't, okay, let's choose this truck. Yep. It was really, let's find the right partner, someone who's as forward-leaning and maybe more so than us about wanting to change the sustainability of the finished vehicle space. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think software, data, and the right product is key. And someone can like, kind of marry those all together exactly. is the perfect solution. So yep. I've been on the charging piece, I've been hearing more and more that there may not need to be a one-to-one -one deployment of charger and truck for an operation in the class eight heavy duty space. That's something that you've been seeing or how are you going about deployment of charging infrastructure in your operations? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and I think it's always the topic now, right? We've gone from, you know, worrying about range anxiety to charging anxiety. Um, and for us, you know, uh, charging is a critical part of our business for both commercial reasons and operational reasons. So when we're looking at how to deploy charging capability, for example, as you see here in a, in a port location, we're, we have to consider it in a wider scope than just around the EV truck or the heavy all trucks that we're deploying. Um, we're looking at sustainability from every facet of our operation. So we're looking at things like EV forklifts, EV, you know, move, ability to move equipment from an EV perspective and a sustainable perspective, those require charging. Uh, we're looking at it from, we deploy a lot of uh, labor around our ports and moving them around with vans. We're now making the similar migration to EVs in our van, uh, in our van space. And how are we going to use charging infrastructure to handle multiple types of charging needs inside of respective sites? So from that perspective, it was relatively easy for us to match up. It wasn't a one-for-one -one need because we had charging needs for multiple uh, issues inside of our operating facilities. In addition to that, of course, um, as I mentioned, we handle automotives. We handle roughly around 7 million cars a year through our network. Um, as we're bringing them in, I think it's no shock to anyone here that we're, we're seeing the advent of greater uptake in EVs globally. Um, and if they're at 8% of total cars sold today, of 80 million cars sold globally today, they, you know, the anticipation is by 20, 30, 35, it's going to be 40 to 50%. Mm -hmm. We're trying to find as, as, as many opportunities to be forward leaning about what type of charging infrastructure do we need to handle customer cargo on top of the cargo that we have, or on top of the operational needs that we have. Gotcha, gotcha. That makes total sense. Um, so keeping on the charging piece then, the biggest concern that I keep hearing from people that are in this kind of same space that you're in is that working with utilities to get the power to a site, to deploy a charger, everything to do with just getting a charger installed from the very beginning of permitting to the actual end of like operation and maintaining them reliably is posing to be a challenge. How have you been addressing some of the challenges? Have you been experiencing challenges working with utilities to get the charger installed? Uh, just walk us through a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think, again, it's... Um it's, it's accurate, right? Um, there's exactly. no doubt that there are huge amounts of challenges when it comes to grid infrastructure. There, depending on which geography you're in, there's always going to be this. I mean, we, we face it, for example, again, even in our ship side, right, where we're looking to, to power ships at, at port with electric, uh, electricity. Um, again, you'll probably hear me say this over and over during our conversation, right, this issue of partnership. It's very difficult to go it alone. We're certainly not at a scale where we could go it alone and probably few, fewer out there, but it's this combination of working together in our case with, for example, port authorities uh, that are state entities coupled with knowledgeable organizations like Enride who are able to look at scale, what's happening in the charging space and what other opportunities do we have to optimize uh, the design of the charging needs. Um, and then, you know, with ourselves being able to reference our own customer base and say, hey, you know, this is what we have to look at in terms of how do we connect funds that are available either through grants, uh, what's happening from a, from a private investment standpoint and, and, and bring about, you know, the same, members of, of groups who are forward leaning and looking at this the same way. I don't want to minimize it. It's a major issue and it continues to be an issue. And it's, it, it will be a challenge, you know, particularly for long haul, right? And, and kind of over the road trucking uh, for some time. But I think we all are, are seeing, particularly here in North America, there's a lot more 
interest to lean into this. There's money, there's funds available, and there's in, in, uh, infrastructure investment happening already to make this uh, happen. And it, it's it, it's different about concentration. I think when you start talking about going into the the, the hinterlands of the U.S., uh, it's going to be more and more difficult, right? But in the areas we're in, port locations, urban areas, uh, you know, I think there is there's 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 good progress. I think moving in that space. And ports are are an area where there's such disproportionate impact in terms of emissions for the communities that are nearby. So it makes a even more positive impact to electrify as much as you possibly can. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that that's what we're hearing more and more as we you know we have very strong relationships with most of the major uh, ports in North America as well as in Europe and Asia and a host of other areas. And you just see this very positive shift towards sustainability initiatives. I mean, I was just in, in, in Belgium last month talking to the port of Antwerp and Zeebrugge, and they are equally as interested in forward leaning uh, about finding out sustainability initiatives around electrification and how do you get to net zero in their terminals as uh, the Maryland Port Authority or the Georgia Ports Authority. And so there's definitely a shift towards, you know, the need as well as recognition of how this not only benefits you know, the sustainable efforts and what's required in terms of CO2 emission reductions, but the communities that they represent, as you said. And we're hearing more and more about, as funds are becoming available through grants and through programs, it is equally as important that we're looking at the communities and not just about the electrification needs inside those port locations, right? I mean, how are we providing a better working living environment for those who are, you know, around, and those tend to be lower socioeconomic areas that will not see the attention that are necess that's necessary yep. to allow that better uh, quality of life for them. And not even just the the communities that, that benefit from going electric, but the the drivers that are driving the trucks also have a, a positive reaction to driving electric as well. It's just an overall better experience to drive yeah. an electric Class A truck than a diesel. Diesel class A truck, like that's just obvious. Well, I mean, it's 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 it's, and we didn't rehearse this, by the way. No, no, this is you know. off the cuff now. But it's really great that you bring that up because at our launch event uh, a few weeks ago in Savannah, uh, we had our driver there, and uh, we had you know great press event. We had people there, and, and Enride, of course, sponsoring, and um, we had the chance. I had the chance to speak with our driver who brought the truck be in behind us at the event. and he told me this great story, and it was probably the best part of the entire event. He said, you know, Mike, I. I called my wife and I call her every day from my truck at 2 p.m. Nice. And I called her yesterday after deploying the, the, this truck and she asked me, where, where the heck are you? She, he said, I'm at work. She said, there's no noise. I can hear you clearly. W what's happening? And for me, that was probably the most impactful part of the entire event, as much as all the great things we're doing with this, to know that our drivers are A, enjoying the experience and see this as an opportunity for them to be re-energized and engaged into their profession, which is an absolutely needed profession in the world, um, says you know a huge amount to me about what the opportunities are that lie ahead for them. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a perfect segue to one of my next questions, which is around, and you mentioned this early in your statements, around the myths of going electric for class eight. I wanted to hear from your perspective, because you've been at the front lines of this, working with diesel and now going to electric. What are some of the myths that you've heard from your competitors or your partners that have been already been busted or are on the cusp of being busted because you're just deploying them and you're learning from them? Sure. Well, I mean, there's, there's a host of them, and I'm sure many of everyone here has considered all of them uh, in their review of it. But I think th some of the things we've learned, and we had ourselves, right? We had these biases already as traditional trucking, shipping company, um, number one being the, the range issue, right? Um, the immediate thing you, you jump upon, like most of us did in our personal lives with personal EVs, was, well, the range anxiety, how is that going to impact us? And the reality is that, yes, there's still challenges in spaces, as we talked about, o over the road, long haul. But in a good area of spaces, and particularly in urban areas, the range issue is, is A, dissipating, right? I mean, whether uh, you look at uh, the the BYD trucks that we're with today with with Enride, or you look at you know Volvo or or, or uh, Tesla, um, the range is improving, and there's you know plenty of studies to suggest that that range only continues to improve. And what's really good about it um, is that as that range continues to improve, the cost also continues to improve. And that's probably the second myth, um, which is well, it's way too expensive 
to uh, consider EV trucking. Um, it's just the upfront costs are so high. And the reality is, though, is when you look at total cost of ownership in comparison to you know what we were utilizing our trucks for in the diesel space, um, it's pretty much a push. Um, it's pretty much on parity for most of the things. When you think about all the maintenance, all the other incremental opportunities you might have, and even at points, the willingness of customers to pay uh, a bit more potentially for the use of a more sustainable solution. Suddenly, you know, that myth starts to dissipate. And I think, as we said, or as I said earlier, as the, as the range continues to grow and the price continues to drop, not dissimilarly to what we see in the automotive space, I think it just starts breaking and busting that myth uh, quite a bit. Uh, and then finally, I think the uh, third one I would say that's been pretty much dispelled at this point is just power and the energy necessary of lifting very heavy loads. You can see, or you did see earlier, some of the size of the pieces of equipment we're moving. Um, these are 50, 60, 70,000 pound pieces of equipment. And initially there was a lot of, I think, you know, speculation about, well, could we actually continue to lift this? Would, it, would the charge stay with that type of heavy workload? And the reality is that the power and torque is probably unmatched and better than what we see in, in a traditional uh, diesel engine. And equally, in our first experiences as we were deploying these, um, we saw that they were being utilized, as I said, million pounds a day, and then by the end of the day, they were going back with 60% charge still remaining. So um, I think the idea that these EV trucks can't perform and match is, uh, is, is, is busted. I think that's a busted it's a good myth to bust. Um, the diesel truck is going to be here for some time as we transition, but sure. it is very much transitioning to be the horse in this evolutionary period to be a better powertrain, to better operation with an electric vehicle. On this kind of future focus mentality then, you're, you're partnering with Enride, which is such a futuristic focus company, not just electric trucks, but autonomous trucks, and you're in the trucking space. Um, what are your thoughts about what the future looks like for Heavy duty trucking in general. Obviously, we get electric and we get autonomous, but yeah, kind of package it together for us. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you touched on it there. It's it's obviously this transformation across those three dimensions, right? It's the connectivity, it's the electrification and autonomy, and it's probably the convergence of all those that really is going to drive the future of long haul heavy trucking, right? I mean, if you see what's happening in the EV space that we've just talked about, right, it's only going to improve. It's only going to get more in terms of range and capability. And I think we just have to just embrace when and how that's going to begin to uh, uh, continue. When you talk about, we, we haven't talked much about the digital space, but the connectivity space, I mean, some of it, I think in the previous session was already touched upon, but it's, it's accurate, right? I mean, if we look at the data that's coming off in, in the Saga platform today for the few trucks that we have, I think that's only going to increase. And I think the ability to leverage AI around things like fleet management mm -hmm. uh, and the optimization of the fleets uh, that people are operating globally, the feedback loops that will be created and, and then connecting that, converging that with autonomy, um, there's no doubt that, you know, look, autonomy has been something that's been discussed in the passenger car world for quite some time and continues to, but I think you've seen a more focus now on EV yeah. than on autonomy because of the challenges that it represents from a regulatory environment, et cetera. Um, but for me, the, the heavy haul truck space is a perfect area to be focusing on autonomy in terms of the ability to, to operate more efficiently, you know, the ability to optimize what's necessary on the growth of the e-commerce business that exists and uh, the ability to optimize not only uh, on efficiency, but sustainability, right? Being able to create autonomous pods and groups of, of trucks moving across the country. So I think it's, it's not going to be substantially different than the paths we're on in those three things. Again, the technology, the connectivity, the electrification, and the autonomy. It's the convergence mm -hmm. that we'll see in the next few years that is only going to you know, logarithmically change, I think, the way EV trucking is, is handling and trucking in general. It's going to transform the industry. And it's already started on that path. Yep. Well, that's a great way to end this. Please join me in thanking Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.